So penicillins, penicillin V being one of the best known of the penicillins, this used to have a much broader range of action, but it's there's a lot of resistance to penicillin, of course, these days. And so it's really only used for a fairly narrow range of streptococci, viridans, streptococci particularly. It can be used as prophylaxis against bacterial endocarditis, and it can also be used against strep pyogenes that causes cellulitis, although its value is limited by its absorption. It has a bioavailability of an oral dose of about 60%. So if penicillin V is taken on an empty stomach, then a reasonable proportion of it is absorbed. But if it's taken after a meal when there's food in the stomach, it has a much lower bioavailability. It um, acts on cell walls and causes cell wall disruption. So it's a, a bactericidal antibiotic. Penicillin G is the same spectrum as penicillin V, but is given parenterally by injection, and much, much higher levels are achieved in the circulation. So it's more effective when it, for the situations when we use it, which is these days is largely for cellulitis. Some of the modified penicillins, so amoxicillin is a synthetic penicillin. It's similar to ampicillin. Ampicillin is more poorly absorbed than amoxicillin, so we tend to give amoxicillin orally, but both of them have exactly the same action if given intravenously. It has an extended spectrum, which means that it has some action against some gram negatives. However, there is some resistance to it among some strep pneumoniae, which of course is a gram positive, and again, and among some haemophilus, which is a gram negative. But it's still, it's got a broader range and so is effective for example against a number of respiratory organisms. Bioavailability of about 95 percent so good absorption. Some allergic reactions so in patients who've had recent um, Epstein-Barr infection, infectious mononucleosis, they're prone to getting a morbilliform type rash, a measles like rash. Coamoxiclav is amoxicillin plus a substance called clavulanic acid. Clavulanic acid inhibits beta-lactamase. So many bacteria produce beta-lactamase as a way of being resistant to penicillin. The beta-lactamase uh, breaks down part of the penicillin ring. And clavulanic acid inhibits the beta-lactamase so that the penicillin isn't broken down and continues to have its action. So that combination, comoxiclav and clavulanic acid, is a very powerful combination and gives a much wider range and much greater effectiveness to a comoxiclav. And it includes both gram-positive and gram-negative organisms. That comoxiclav can be given intravenously, but tends to be mostly an oral agent. And when we want something similar intravenously, then the usual combination is called tazosin, which is a combination of piperacillin, which is an extended spectrum of penicillin, and tazobactam, which is very similar to clavulanic acid. And that combination has a similar action to coamoxiclav and is given parenterally by injection. So piperacillin is one of the extended spectrum penicillins. There's others, azlocillin, tucarcillin, etc. And they have a much wider spectrum about against gram-positive and gram-negative organisms and also some anaerobes. They also have a synergistic effect with aminoglycosides. So piperacillin and gentamicin is a powerful combination against many gram-negative organisms and also having some anaerobic cover. So it's very useful for sepsis that arises from intestinal organisms in particular. Cephalosporins is the next class. Now this is a class of antibiotics that's related to penicillins. They're chemically quite similar and they're also naturally occurring chemicals. And these have gone through a number of generations. We've got four generations of cephalosporins, but they're less widely used these days because they're particularly associated with the formation of C. diff or Clostridium difficile diarrhea, pseudomembranous colitis. Third generation cephalosporins like keftriaxone, kefataxime, these are still used for, uh, in particular, situations 
So we use third generation cephalosporins for meningitis, for example, for blanket treatment of meningitis. So there still is some role for them, but much less than there was. There is a cross sensitivity between penicillin and cephalosporin. So about 10% of people who are genuinely penicillin allergic will also be allergic to cephalosporins. Just to mention that most patients who believe they're penicillin allergic, at least in the UK, actually aren't. And if you actually test people, only about 10% of those who believe they're penicillin allergic really are. So that's cephalosporins. Let's use now.